Our presenters for this portion of the symposium are Carl and Joan Tomoff, who are coming to us from Prescott, Arizona. And Carl and Joan are lifelong naturalists who have spent lots of time exploring the Mogollon terrain and have lots to share with us tonight. Both of them had careers as educational professionals. Carl was a faculty member at Prescott College teaching environmental science and Joan taught math and science from middle school into college age students. And so they're used to sharing their knowledge with generations of students and they're going to extend it to us tonight. Um, Carl and Joan have just put together a collaboration on a wonderful book and Joan, who's taken up photography, is a part of this presentation as well because they're going to talk about their book, which is a field guide to the woody plants of the Mogollon Highlands. So we look forward to hearing about your experiences in the Mogollon, guys. Hello, everyone. We're delighted to introduce you to our book, Woody Plants of the Mogollon Highlands, a field guide and botany companion. This colorful guide to over 80 species of trees, shrubs, and succulents of this diverse region also explains relevant botanical and ecological processes. Our book was published by the Natural History Institute in Prescott. Um, this institute provides leadership and resources for a revitalized practice of natural history. They sponsor programs that integrate art, science, and humanities to promote the health and well-being of humans and the rest of the natural world. The book was designed by Melina Walling and edited by Tom Fleischner and Bob Ellis. All proceeds from sales of our book support the Natural History Institute and its mission. Our working title for years was Woody Plants of the Central Arizona Highlands, but the people at the Natural History Institute had described the area, which does extend into New Mexico, and their label seemed more appropriate. The Mogollon people lived in the border area and south into Mexico for several hundred years until about 1400. The Mogollon Rim at the edge of the Colorado Plateau has had its name for decades, whereas the Mogollon Highlands label is relatively new. So here's the Mogollon Highlands um, topographic map showing the, the location of the Highlands ecoregion of Arizona and New Mexico. Um, with deserts in the south and mountains and mesas in the north, as well as the sky islands that Jack told you about last night, this region is a transition zone of continental significance. Its location at a biogeographic crossroads means it has tremendous ecological diversity. Botanically, the region is where Canada merges with Mexico. Um, it, it would be nice to have that, the Sky Jacobs graphic showing biogeographic bio -geographic influences that Jack showed last night because um, the influences are very similar to those of the Sky Islands. The Southern Rocky Mountains extend into the Eastern Mogollon Highlands, and all four of North America's deserts converge in the region. The Great Basin and Mojave from the north and northwest, and the Sonoran and Chihuahuan from the south. The Mogollon Highlands also connects two great physiographic provinces, the Colorado Plateau and the Basin and Range. The region exhibits dramatic topography varying several thousand feet in elevation and including a series of deep canyon systems that drain the Colorado Plateau and emerge into the deserts below. In this exciting landscape of high conifer forests, escarpments, canyons, mesas, and deserts, northern limits of some species overlap with southern species limits of others. However, the area remains less understood by naturalists than either the Colorado Plateau or the Sonoran Desert. Our book is an invitation to explore and discover this magnificent region. So this vegetation map shows, there's Prescott, Cayman is up here, Flagstaff, and way down here is Silver City, New Mexico, and Phoenix. So we classify plant communities into vegetation types based on their structure and species composition. Our book includes plant communities from desert grasslands around 3,500 feet to conifer forests on mountain slopes and summits above 8,000 feet. As the landscape rises in elevation and precipitation increases, biomass increases and the vertical structure changes. Species are arranged in relative elevational sequence within the primary vegetation type where they're commonly found, although many grow in more than one habitat and we describe six major plant communities. Grasslands are single layer, 
They support mostly herbaceous plants because water deficiency sets limits on how low a plant can grow. Two layer shrublands of interior chaparral support shrubs as well as grasses and herbs. Many chaparral plants have southern subtropical ancestry, so they're limited by low winter temperatures that can kill seedlings that have germinated during the long warm growing season. Three layer evergreen woodlands contain short trees as well as shrubs and herbaceous plants. Many of these plants have dense populations because they're in the middle of their elevational ranges. And finally, ponderosa pine forests and mixed conifer forests have all four layers, tall trees and a variety of understory plants. Low temperatures usually determine species upper elevation limits, but for species with north temperate ancestry like white fir, the short growing season can also restrict reproduction. And riparian deciduous woodlands occur from desert lowlands to mountain highlands. Generally, species reach their upper elevation limits on south-facing slopes. There's a south-facing slope. Um, and lower limits on north-facing slopes, like this one, and also in canyon bottoms. And this slide shows the basin effect or the slope effect. In shaded basins in canyons, thermal and moisture inversions result in complex plant communities with higher species diversity than areas with more uniform topography. Cool air flowing into drainage bottoms, like this one here, cools the soil and slows evaporation, so species like ponderosa pines reach their low elevation limits, shown here growing below patches of woodland. There's woodland, and on the other side is chaparral. Here you can also see short tree woodland. Oh yeah, so this is on the north facing slope and the chaparral is on the south facing slope. We also in this book provide our readers with an introduction to basic plant biology that includes plant types and how planets manage to live in the world, including details about how leaves function, pollinators, nitrogen fixation, and mycorrhizae. So now here's Carl. Hello. So how do you identify a plant? We suggest that you ask some questions about its growth form and leaf characteristics. Is it a tree, a shrub, a succulent? Are its leaves evergreen or deciduous? Are the leaves scales like on juniper, needles like on pines, <clears throat> or do they have blades like more typical leaves? If bladed, are the leaves simple or compound? If compound, are they palmate, pinnate, or bipinnate? How are the leaves arranged? Are they attached singly or alternating along the stem, or do they emerge in pairs opposite each other? We recommend asking these questions in this sequence because it reflects your experience as you approach a plant and are able to see more details. We organized our guide using a few key principles. We put plants into sections by the plant community where they're most commonly found. We arrange plants according to their growth forms. So within each section, we start with trees and move to shrubs, lianas, and finally to succulents. Commonly confused species or ones that are frequently found together are often placed on opposing pages. For more information on every plant, you can flip to the text section found after each group of color plates. On some of the plates, you might find a note that signals there's a special botany topic associated with species. And now we'll show you some examples of woody plants in their preferred vegetation zones. Riparian deciduous woodlands are among the most diverse in a region, zoologically as well as botanically. They contain not only unique species, but they include non-riparian ones from adjacent habitats. Cottonwoods, willows, box elder maple, Velvet ash and Arizona walnut often form the gallery. The dense cavity canopy foliage shows that more water is available along the drainage than in the more arid adjacent upland. Notice the slope effect shown at the top where evergreen woodland and plains grassland grow on opposing slopes. Cottonwoods produce lo catkins loaded with flowers that open before leaves emerge. Typical of wind pollinated plants, these flowers have no petals. Trees are dioecious, having either female or male flowers. Fremont and narrow leaf cottonwoods can hybridize and produce Hinkley cottonwoods with leaves that are intermediate in shape. 
we refer the reader to page 57 for a special botany topic on hybrids. This slide shows a shaded box that describes the hybrids. It is also has information about topics such as taxonomy, distribution, habitat, ethnobotany, and etymology of scientific names. A riparian woodland courses through desert grassland in the Agua Fria National Monument. This grassland contains a mosaic of vegetation that includes patches of chaparral and juniper woodland, which are characteristic of higher elevations. You can also see mesquite, cacla acacia, cacla mimosa, also called wait a minute bush, and some cacti. These desert scrub species are more cold hardy than the saguaros and palo verdes of the Sonoran Desert. These two catclaw shrubs have sharp curved prickles derived from epidermis that may provide defense for murmurbars. Here's a way to remember how many prickles each has and how they are arranged along a stem. The capital A in acacia has one peak and its prickles occur singly, while the M in mimosa has two peaks and its prickles occur in pairs. So note the leaves are deciduous microphylls, typical of plants that live in dry environments. This higher elevation plains grassland in Chino Valley north of Prescott has scrub oaks from chaparral growing on north facing slopes. These oaks are near their lower elevation limit in the region. Mountain grassland occurs at even higher elevations. Narrowleaf yucca and barrow grass are two evergreen semi-succulents typical of grasslands. This yucca has sharp, flexible, nearly linear gray-green leaves that grow in a hemispherical rosette up to two feet high. It produces dry seed capsules from conspicuous white flowers. Interior chaparral, like this site west of Prescott, is a fire-adapted ecosystem dominated by evergreen shrubs. Many genera are similar to those in coastal chaparral, reflecting their common ancestry. Chaparral can recover pretty rapidly from fire because some species sprout from root crowns while others produce abundant seeds that can be dormant for decades before extreme heat stimulates their germination. Note the subtle canyon effect, a single bare cottonwood tree in the drainage. Here's an example of two ecologically connected species that are shown together. Scrub oak is a common evergreen shrub or short tree that often grows in dense thickets in chaparral and evergreen woodlands. It provides acorns for jays, squirrels, and other wildlife. Oak mistletoe is an opposite-leaved evergreen hemiparasite drawing water and minerals from the parade of oak species that occur from chaparral into the conifer forests. Its green leaves indicate that it can photosynthesize some of its own food. Western bluebirds, insectivores, during the summertime during their breeding season in the ponderosa pine belt become feed intensely interested and will feed on the white berries during winter. We keep mistletoe on some of our oak trees because we like having these birds in our neighborhood. Evergreen woodlands can be described by their dominant trees and ecological distribution. The Madrean oak pine juniper woodlands feature a variety of evergreen oaks including scrub, emery, and Arizona white, pinions, and the alligator juniper. They are similar to woodlands in the southern Sky Islands, where oak woodlands are also common. Some woodlands have only pinion pines. Pinions are evergreen trees with complex taxonomy that occupy different geographic ranges and vary in the number of needles per bundle. Pinus edulis, or Colorado pinion, may produce one or two needles per bundle. It is the dominant species in the Mogollon Highlands and extends into Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. Both twigs at the bottom are Colorado pinion. The three needle bundle on top is ponderosa pine shown for contrast. Other pinions not shown are Pinus monophylla or single needle pinion, which occurs primarily in California and Nevada. And Pinus sembroides or Mexican pinion with three needles per bundle, which grows in the sky islands of the Southeast Arizona and Northwest Mexico. Like many other plants, pinions produce hybrids where their ranges overlap. Juniper woodlands may contain Utah and one seed juniper with or without pinions. These often extensive uniform woodlands are similar to those in the Great Basin. Here's another example of similar species shown together. Alligator juniper and Arizona cypress 
have scale-like evergreen leaves. This juniper is dioecious, meaning male and female plants are separate. The cypress is monoecious, meaning male and female reproductive parts grow on the same plants. The juniper produces small berry-like cones. The cypress makes larger scale ones. Both are Southern or Madrean species. Ponderosa pine forests on the Colorado Plateau generally lack evergreen oaks. However, pine forests of the Mogollon Highlands and the Sky Islands to the south typically do have an understory of oaks. This view in the Bradshaw south of Prescott shows emery and Arizona white oaks growing under the ponderosa pine canopy. Gamble oak and fender oak are two species that are frequently found together. Gamble oak grows with evergreen oaks in their upper range and extends beyond them into the fir forest. It's a deciduous oak with alternate lobed leaves. Male flowers without petals hang in catkins and open before female flowers they grow in axles on short stalks on the same plants. Fender ceanothus is a common understory shrub with thorns and oval leaves. It fixes nitrogen in the soil. Mixed conifer forest is the highest elevation forest in the Mogollon Highlands, with Douglas fir, white fir, gamble oak, and aspen, as shown here at the headwaters of the Hacienda River. A traditional jingle regarding conifer needles states that Firs are flat and friendly, spruce sharp and square in cross section, and pines come in packets. However, we know of no spruce within the Mogollon Highlands. Douglas fir cones have distinctive three-pointed bracts emerging from cone scales that suggest a mouse diving for cover with its hind leg and tail exposed. Douglas fir cones hang while white fir cones stand erect, and Douglas fir cones persist after shedding seeds while white fir cones disintegrate as they disperse their seeds. We'd like to leave you with some autumn color displayed by two of our beautiful high mountain trees. On the left, growing in canyons and in moist slopes, big tooth maples opposite leaves become red with cooling weather. Its wing seeds spiral through the cool air as they disperse. On the right is one of the most widely distributed species in North America, the quaking aspen. Aspens grow in moist soil with plenty of sunshine. This relative of cottonwoods can form dense clonal stands as the forest recovers from fire or other disturbance. Its fluttery leaves turn gold in autumn. We hope that our book will enrich your explorations in nature and inspire you to discover the seasonal changes that each species displays throughout the year. Thank you for your interest and attention. Thanks so much, Joan and Carl. That was really fun to see the work you've put into that book. And, and it's really interesting the way you've grouped species that have sort of ecological relationships. Um, one question we had is answered with this sl slide that you had on the screen, which was where to get your book. Briefly, the, the Natural History Institute has outlets with Jay's Bird Barn in Prescott and in Flagstaff, and the Peregrine Bookstore in downtown Prescott. Those are the, currently the sites where their book is available. Okay, great, that's good information. So one question we had from a member of the audience is, could you explain what you mean when you say chaparral? What is chaparral? A chaparral? Yes, I got Well, I, I've heard a number of things through the years. One is- uh, Oak, I mean, the little scrub oak, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. And the, the, the words chaps comes from the leathered flaps that horsemen had to use to get through that dense vegetation. So from an from a anthropological point of view, it has origins apparently in the, the cowboys that work through the chaparral. So that's one of the things that I've heard. So it, it's dense, but um, is that the, I mean, there are lots of places that have dense vegetation that wouldn't be called chaparral. What's characteristic of the species in chaparral? It's, yeah, it's really scrubby and thorny and sticky and like a lot of other communities, it, it occurs in a continuum. Uh, chaparral can be open, moderate, or closed in density. So it's, it's a little bit oversimplified just to call it dense. That's sort of expressed in what it has become in many parts of, the, of its distribution. Hence, and it is a fire adapted ecosystem so that that density does help promote fire, which can, they can recover fairly quickly as mentioned earlier. But the pre predominant growth form is an evergreen shrub because there are other woodlands that are like the Great Basin Desert Scrub where sagebrush, which is deciduous, semi-deciduous, 
uh, has a different, uh, you know, growth form. Mm -hmm. A lot of the chaparral plants are also nitrogen fixing, which is sort of interesting. So they enrich the soil that they grow in. In mm -hmm. fact, that Fender Cianothus that was shown has a cousin, the desert Cianothus or desert lavender in chaparral in function that Joan has just mentioned. Interesting. I saw a mention in your, in showing your pictures from your book about um, bark beetles. And I was wondering if you could summarize, if you can, what the situation is now with bark beetle attacks in the Mogollon Rim. Is that, is that still a really big problem in the forests there? I know. I don't think I can answer that question uh, because I haven't been able to cap keep up with that. But I, since there haven't been much <coughs> news, I would hopefully it is not something that is a major problem. But they're always um, there. They are part of this natural ecosystem. So they're there, and as Joan points out, they, they remain. But it's a matter of dry conditions where the plants don't have their enough water to initiate their, their res defensive responses to fight the beetles that uh, could result in another emergence of the beetles. Yeah, I mean, we, we water the trees in our yard just hoping to keep them able to defend themselves against attacks by beetles. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So we have another question from someone in the audience and they asked if you could recite the jingle again that oh, sure. to spruce and fir and... Yeah, sure. And, and that's got its different variations like lots of these folk things, uh, but yeah, furs... So what we're talking about now is the cross sec part of it is the cross section of the needle. So firs are flat and friendly, and that means that they're actually elliptical in cross section. Spruce are sharp, that means the tip. And the friendly, going back to that, is because the tip of the fir leaves, whether they're the Douglas fir or true firs, are fairly blunt and rounded. So they're, they're, if you were to shake hands with the branch, you would not be uh, annoyed with the prickly sharp sensation you'd get when you shook hands with a spruce. And if you take a close look at spruce needles, cut them in half, they're square in cross section. So fir firs are flat and friendly, shake hands. Spruce are sharp and square, and pines come in packets. They have little fascicle bundles, the little yeah. tissue that holds the, the needles together. The one has simply got a little remnant of the, this fascicles. Two or three or five needles have a, a little bundle that holds them together. So that's, yeah. that's where that came from. Those little devices are so helpful for some of the you know, things that we think this should be so easy, but it really, really pro provokes your re re recollection at, at times. So that's great. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing your book with us. And um, we hope that you will enjoy the rest of the symposium with us. Well, we certainly will. We, we're thankful to have the opportunity to be part of the whole, the whole event.